pulses, a growing, expanding protein commodity produced by agriculture. And we're going to talk all about pulses with an expert coming to you from Canada in this episode of the Business of Agriculture. Hey, Damian Mason here with a question before we hop into this episode of the Business of Agriculture. If you farm for a living, you employ a lot of amazing technology from your inputs that you put into the soil to the tractor that you sit in, your combine, and the amazing data that it harvests. But has your soil analytics kept up technologically with everything else in your farming operation? I would venture to say that no, it is not. Sure, you check for your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and potassium, your micronutrients as well. But what about disease pressure? Do you know what diseases and what pests you're going to face next year? No, you don't. But you can now figure that out with Pattern Ag's predictive analytics. Think about it. They can tell you now with testing what the likelihood of facing nasty diseases, things like cyst nematode or uh, sudden death syndrome, what the likelihood of you having this in your field, then you know how to prepare, how to treat, and where to invest your money. It's using technology to make you bigger yields and therefore make you bigger money. Go to www.pattern.ag to learn more. They are pioneering the way in predictive agronomy. Hey there, welcome to another fantastic episode of the Business of Agriculture. We've got returning guest, Lionel uh, Cambites. He's um, he's a Canadian and he's an entrepreneur. He's an agricultural guy. He was on three and a half years ago talking about uh, plant-based protein going into pasta. No, we're not talking about fake meat. We're not going, and trust me, I would, I would jump off a bridge before I would ever start going on here and talking about that because I'm disgusted by it. No, we're talking about pulses. You, if you're in agriculture and you're like from the Midwest, like me, you're probably saying pulses. You mean like you're checking somebody's pulse? No, I'm talking about a plant. I'm talking about a thing that we harvest, we we sell it, and people eat it. And I didn't even know what it was myself until about a decade ago when I was working in either the Prairie Provinces or in Montana, and these farmers are talking about pulses. So anyway, Mr. Cambites, kind of exciting news. Your company, Above Foods, up there in Saskatchewan is expanding. You're buying an American-based company that does um, some work in this space. And most people that even endeavor in agriculture, unless they're where you're from, or maybe those uh, Mountain West states up there like Montana, they're like, what the heck are we even talking about? So I want you to start me off uh, with introducing yourself and then also tell me about what pulses are. Well, thank you very much, Damien. Good to see you again, by the way. And uh... And uh, you've aged well over the last three years. Congratulations! <laughs> uh, but uh, here we are. Uh, pulses are, are, of course, the 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 proliferation of pulses in the last twenty years here in Canada and a, a, some of the northern plains of the United States are really about growing lentils. As as we come drier and drier, lentils has become quite a drought resistant crop. Growing chickpeas, yellow peas, uh, all of the all of the members, the new members of the pea family that are there as well. And this has become a predominant crop here in Western Canada and the Northern Plains, just recently the Northern Plains of the United States. And it's becoming, of course, one of the proteins of choices for some of the new menus and the new foods that we read about. So a chickpea, a garbanzo bean, is it a, is it a pulse? It is a pulse. It, yes, okay. it is, yes. So so we are familiar with that. I mean, but there's also lentils, which we've heard of lentil soup, and that's a that's a pulse as well. It is, yeah. And lentils make up a significant amount of the pulse trade that is grown here in North America. Lentils make that up. So yeah, the lentil, of course, has become a, a, a high, highly prized protein, as you're well aware, already included in most vegetarian diets in India and other places in the world where where the, there is a strict vegetarian protocol, but also very, very uh, 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 getting quite involved in the North American pet food industry. Uh, they like they like protein and they like the lentil protein as a good cost effective protein for pet food. And of course, the better for you diet. Everybody wants to eat slightly more plant but they want to eat better quality plant. They want better protein. They want better functionality. So these uh, these these are nothing new to you. You're a large scale. You're from a large scale farming operation in the Prairie Provinces. It's fairly new to United States uh, agriculture, uh, and you're and you're expanding into that. We'll get to that in a little bit. As far as where the products go, uh, the average person listening to this can say, "Okay, I, I went through the salad bar and I saw." garbanzo beans or chickpeas. I like calling them garbanzo beans. It's more fun to say. And But I don't know how the hell to eat a lentil. 
I mean, I've heard of lentil soup. I don't even know how to make it. I don't even know where to buy lentils. So kind of take me down this road of the human consumption part of it, and then we'll talk about the pet food part. Yeah, certainly. And I'll, I'll go back for a minute, if I can, Nadine, into the garbanzo bean. So first of all, the garbanzo bean was having its day, and we like eating a few garbanzo beans in our salads. Then suddenly hummus came along, and we all decided that that was kind of an international food that us North Americans were going to start eating. And it's become a very important part of the snacking regime of Americans. We have hummus at every event that, that we go to, many of these public events. So of course, the garbanzo bean, the chickpea, is the core ingredient to hummus. So By the way, really, I, I just want to throw that out there because the, the person says, why is he why is he talking about hummus now when we start talking about chickpeas or garbanzo beans? Um, I'm at the Delta Sky Club because I travel a lot. And in the Delta Sky Club, they put out you know snacks and food. And I i don't think I've been in the Delta Sky Club for the last five years where they didn't have hummus. Same thing with pita bread. Um, I had hummus for the first time 30 years ago in the mid 90s, about when it, I think it made its debut or maybe my socioeconomic rise uh, uh, intersected where hummus was being served. I don't know. We didn't certainly have it on the dairy farm growing up, but I agree with you. I have some in my refrigerator right now. The core ingredient is the, the garbanzo bean and then I believe just olive oil or vegetable oil is it pretty much and then some garlic and That's some a, flavoring. It's a very, very purest product. It's a crush. It's a crushed garbanzo bean. It's exactly olive oil and some flavoring. And and look at us. When you go to the hummus, at the, it used to be at the supermarket, there was hummus. Now there's 20 varieties of hummus. Yeah. So it's become a very, very popular snacking item. And then lastly, just before we leave the chickpea, there's a, a demand for alternate proteins in pasta. Everybody's looking for more out of their pasta. They want more protein. They want more fiber. They want more out of pasta because we love pasta. So there's a, a, a an emerging market in, in the pasta business for, for chickpea, chickpea flour to be made, or garbanzo bean flour to be made into pasta. So you can buy pasta that is made out of garbanzo beans as well, uh, or mixtures thereof. Yeah, and so that satisfies if a person that wants to cut back on meat, or, or you want more protein, you can have the spaghetti and meatball, or you got a spaghetti with, say, some butter or oil on it. And if it's a protein-based pasta, you're getting some protein there versus just carbohydrate. And that's a new thing that you and I covered uh, three or four years ago on the last time you were on the show. It is. And, 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 it's, and it's consistently growing since we covered it, uh, Damien. It's really consistently growing. So the fact is that they not only want more, uh, they not only want more protein, uh, what, they, what they're after in pasta, they're after more fiber. Fiber, fiber, you know, 90, 90% plus of North Americans are fiber deficient. And what better than pasta? We buy whole wheat bread, we buy things like that to give us fiber. Yep. What better than pasta to be able to do that? Let's go back to the lowly lentil, which has become such a fantastic crop because of the world's getting drier. There's no yep. magic here. The, the places are getting drier. Dry land, Northern Plains of the United States and dry land, Western Canada is drier. The lentil, we like to call it the prairie cactus sometimes, is a great survivor in dry land farming, and it's been very prolific. The, the growth in the lentil business has come because it's a high protein, high protein alternative, and it's become quite an alternative. And even in North America, for those that are wanting to, again, introduce, uh, I call it their flexitarians. They wanna eat some meat like we all do. We all wanna go Friday night, and we wanna fire up the barbecue. But on Thursday and Wednesday, maybe we want to we want to go a little more vegetarian, a little less meat. Anybody who's a flexitarian, we find ourselves there's quite a movement towards lentil based to be able to get high protein, high protein and, and good fiber in your diet. Yep. What about okay, the we'll go with production second. Let's go with consumption first. Since you, you kept talking about the diet, this lentil. Like I said, we hear of lentil soup, but you're saying it gets used a lot of other ways. Tell me where it where it goes. Where does it go on the dinner plate when it leaves? When it leaves your one of your facilities, where does it go? It goes first. It does. It's it's generally taken out and it's either split or kept whole, and it's put into nice one pound, usually transparent bags. People like buying lentils in a bag, but they view them, they look at them, they like the color, they like the shape, and they buy that. They buy the brand accordingly. So you buy that as a dry product, much like you buy a bag of rice. You okay. Buy a bag but of and a lentil is more like a 
it's like a it's like a, if you took a hammer and hit a P. Is that a an accurate statement? Yeah, it's a saucer. It looks like a little flying saucer. Is what it does. It's a perfectly it's a perfect little flying saucer, and you can split that lentil and then buy it as a split lentil, or you can buy it as a whole lentil, whatever you prefer. Now, the, the emerging market for lentils as well, Damien, has been the plant, the 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 new high high quality plant based pet food industry. Yeah. That's growing at a, at a 10% compound annual growth rate. And they are, they want, the pet food industry wants better plant-based products. And they're replacing some of the, what they would call the, the, the poor quality animal, animal products that they're using. Yeah. They're slowly but surely replacing those with higher quality plant-based protein. So that's a big growth area for the lentil business, which is the, as you know, the humanization of pets. People yeah. that are treating their pets like they're their children, of course. Yeah, I might be guilty of. Uh, I, I I don't give them a vegetarian diet, but uh, the good thing is at least they're giving them protein because obviously canines are carnivorous. But um, I am guilty of overspending on my dogs compared to certainly what I did on the farm growing up uh, with Jack and Rosa. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a big category there. I want to hear some more about all of this. And like I said, I want to talk about the, the uh, drought resistance and the production aspect of it. Before I do that, I want to ask my Midwest corn, soybean, and wheat producers um, about you and your evolution. The evolution of agronomic strategy from my partner, Redox Bionutrients, is a new way of thinking of getting more with less. Okay. We talk about uh, right now, commodity prices where they are. We're talking about natural resources. You're under more scrutiny than you've ever been. And my prediction is the USDA and every other entity in the United States of America and government is going to be probably monitoring that more and more. So how do you get more with less? Well, what about ultra efficient plant nutrition using superior biostimulants? Redox, the family owned and operated business out of Burley, Idaho with 30 years of success throughout the United States and abroad. The Pathway Program, their Pathway Program, combines flagship products like Mainstay SI and Banks with breakthrough nitrogen optimization through their new RDXN technology. You can find out more, including detailed information and agronomic contacts. Go to redoxgrows.com slash Midwest. Redoxgrows.com slash Midwest. So the marketplace, before we get into production, are you confident, Lionel, that the marketplace... It's already expanded a lot, and we know about, like you said, the the humanization of pets. Um, where you know we got far with those those companies I called Farmers Dog, where they send you uh, refrigerated packets of of specialty food, and I'm like Farmers Dog. Our Farmers Dog growing up got whatever the family of eleven didn't eat. Uh, on top of some uh, Kmart brand dog food, so you know, it had gravy, it had potatoes, it had cable, it had everything, but. <laughs> Farmer Dog and all these other companies, we talk about that demand, which we you say is growing, but the human consumption de- demand for lentils, like you said, from flexitarian uh, ideals and uh, menu options uh, to um, to overseas, possibly, you know, like you talk about India, et cetera. Where's the growth look uh, four years, five years from now? I mean, are we talking 10% a year, 20% a year in terms of consumption? No, I think we're talking about a 7% CAGR, CAM, compound annual growth rate. And Seven. I think, yeah, I think the primary market, everybody is, I like the way you started out here, David. You talked about, we're not talking about making uh, meat out of, out, of, out, of, out of lentils here, out of pulses. Yeah. I think that we have to go back to the core fundamentals. When we look at it, over 40% of the world's calories are rice. Let's use that as an example. Now, heaven forbid the rice producers are going to be mad at me. But you and I know it's one of the emptiest calories that you can eat, a rice and a potato. I mean, they're they're just the the amount of the amount of uh, protein, the amount of fiber. It's quite empty. It's so it's 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 really it's just a it's carbohydrate. It has yeah. been it was easily produced. Um, and I'm not picking on rice and potato production. I'm just saying you can get a good bang for your buck and create a a staple starch, and that's why those yeah. have been the world's two starches. Um, but as you say. You're not going to you're not going to be playing middle linebacker on a rice or potato diet probably because no. of the proteins and some of the other nutrients and that's where you think some of these alternative uh, crops that we've never really thought much about like lentils supplement. Imagine imagine a half a bowl of lentils instead of a half a bowl of rice every day as your as your carbohydrate. The yeah. difference yeah are you, are you at fifteen percent protein on a lentil perhaps and maybe six seven eight percent protein on rice or less. So you're absolutely right. The first thing, the first growing market is a higher quality 
higher quality plant product that you're already eating in your diet. You're just substituting it for a little more, a little bit of a more healthy approach, aren't you? Functionality. That's what you're doing. Let's really recognize that's a huge growth. To be able to be a replacement is still the largest way to grow a market. Just replace a bag of this. Instead of buying two bags of rice, you're going to buy a bag of lentils and a bag of rice. What we just said now keeps a, a whole county of lentils growing in Montana, doesn't it? If you could just do that. So yeah, I mean, my, that's that's that, that's the core, I think. Yeah. So my rice friends won't like that. But I also, let's admit also, uh, dear rice producers, last I looked, the United States, we grow rice in like six or eight states. And I think we produce 1% of global rice production because we're so, we're, we're just so not, well, it's not our preferred carbohydrate, whatever. So uh, yeah. don't get too bent out of shape. You'll still sell your, your rice. What I'm wondering then, Lionel, is this 7% annualized growth, that doesn't sound like a lot. But when you compare it to these other commodities that, for God's sakes, I just shot a video this morning. We love making soybeans. We're oversupplied on soybeans. We don't need any more soybeans. We just don't from a global standpoint. This looks like a pretty positive niche in agriculture. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's a quality niche that is driven by, again, buying a, buying a higher quality for what you're eating today. It's it's a it's positive secondarily for that that emerging flexitarian as as I get older I'm eating less red meat I love red meat but I'm eating less of it and 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 uh, and I just find that I feel a little bit better if I if I eat a little less red meat I save it for my weekend my weekend uh, uh, meat binge so I think in that regard we the, the flexitarian movement is upon us uh, certainly the vegetarian movement is there as well significantly in pet food. We have to understand a significance of, of pet food. And finally, remember that the, the core market as well, globally, that large Indian market, that, that huge, huge market in, the, in, in Asia, yep. they too, they too want to eat better. They want more functionality right. and, and uh, in, in, in moving forward and moving towards, towards that. So I'm all in all, it, it, it's a, it's a, a, a growing opportunity. When we come to the yellow pea, which is a, 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 one of the, it's considered to be one of the world's new proteins. It's challenging. It's challenging today soybeans for the production in the, in the production and growth of what I call plant-based protein concentrates and isolates. So yeah. for example, uh, there's been over a billion, B, billion dollars of protein fractionation plants built in Canada just to just do yellow pea, just doing the yellow pea. Mm -hmm. Now, soybean is, is common globally. It's fabulous crop. It's a great success crop. But suddenly there, there's, there's significant growth in what I call yellow pea protein. People are looking for an alternative to soybean as well. Some of the new recipe developers are saying, I want to go. I want to go with a with a yellow pea protein. Yeah. I don't want to go with a soy protein. So, so the, the yellow pea is very very big. Then all right, lentil yellow pea is different than chickpea. How? Well, just again, the chickpeas are garbanzo bean, and the yellow pea looks like a a yellow pea. Okay, it's the pea that's yellow. <clears throat> and and so the sweet peas that I buy from uh, from Jolly Green Giant, um, does it look about that same size? Yeah, it has. Yeah, it can. Yeah, the size, different size of it. It's it's truly like a green pea, but it's a yellow pea. And um, let's go within your statement that you see real opportunity here because of, and, and this is a big one I've been on. I've been telling people, and they don't like to hear it, that we are going to change land use and cropping systems because of either regulatory or just because of the economics of water. Uh, you know, several million acres of California is being idled because of water uh, supply issues. We have been depleting the Ogallala Aquifer in six or seven states in the Central Plains and Western Plains of the United States for 40 years. And I've said, you know, grain sorghum is drought tolerant and doesn't need irrigation. It could it could go from six million acres to 16 and it would be just fine and then we don't need corn or soybeans grown in western kansas no offense to my friends out there um lentils fit the bill you don't need to irrigate lentils and you still get a crop that you can make some money on am i right in saying that you you absolutely are right they are a very very drought tolerant crop one of the reasons they they were they've been introduced so successfully they're also nitrogen fixing as you know 
So the amount of nitrogen, and if we're going to believe that 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 if a consumer wants to put a CO two footprint on the box of food that we're buying, yeah. Well, when you when you when you fill that when you fill that box of food with nitrogen fixing, like a lentil is, you've lowered the actual carbon dioxide coming from nitrogen use uh, on that as well. So there's a there's a benefit there as well, Damien. Yeah. So what you've got a point there is. I, I just released an episode recently where I said, you know, nitrogen is the new boogeyman. Uh, look at what's yeah. going on in Europe, European Union, some of the regulatory stuff. And you can make a real good case that pulse crops, uh, yeah. again, they're legumes. So they they you're not p- applying nitrogen and you're even fixing nitrogen and you're taking that out of the atmosphere. There's a lot of real good stories. What if I want to grow uh, some of these pulse crops in some of these areas I just spoke of, the panhandle of Texas? How do they handle the heat? It's so one thing to be dry. How do they handle 104 degrees? They, uh, interestingly enough, they if they're not stressed, they tend to, to yield poorer. They have to be, they like heat stress at the right time. You have to get them to that, bring them on up and, and take them to about 45 days, maybe 50 days of growth. And then, then let's turn some of that Texas heat on them. And that makes them cr- create seed. And what has to be developed as well is the ma- massive cutter bars that can now harvest these lentils. They're very short, and they can harvest them on the ground and and bring those in. So I think there's a tremendous application for many dry land areas in the United States, and I think particularly in areas where they can still properly squeeze in a double crop. It's a fast crop; it mm-hmm. comes in fast, and you can truly double crop that around the weather. Okay, so. A couple of things. Double crop. Do you mean that if I am in, say, Kansas in a very dry area and I take my wheat off uh, sometime in uh, early June, I don't know, can this, can I put in a pulse crop after that? Yes, that's exactly the point I'm trying to say here. I think you have a, uh, there. I think it's going to be a very good tight window crop in those areas that some sometimes can properly double crop. Other times they run out of, they run out of time. I think it can be worked. It, yeah, they, they can be worked in day. What Got it. What about then? By the way, you you held up your hands. We have a visual format on YouTube and Acres TV, dear listener. If you've never watched, you can watch the business of agriculture on Acres TV. Just go on Acres TV. It's a nice streaming platform uh, set up by the Hefty Brothers, and just look up me, Damian Mason, business of agriculture. You can also go to YouTube. I wish you would. I uh, really want to build the uh, the the following there on YouTube and putting out more videos all the time. Go to YouTube, type in Damian Mason. But we're also mostly an audio platform. Most people listen to this when they're driving their car, their truck, their tractor. And Mr. Cambites just said they're a very short crop, these lentils, and he held his hands up. So those of you that were listening, you don't know what he gestured. Did he gesture three inches or three feet? What is that height that these plants grow to usually? One foot. It's not a. It's no. It's not a. It's not uncommon at harvest time to be harvesting a crop that is six or eight inches high. Okay. So we've got to have a cutter bar that doesn't leave much. Uh, doesn't leave much uh, on the ground because th- there's there's product down there. It's a haircut. You got to give it a haircut. You got to give the ground a haircut to get it done properly. What about um, what about the 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 stretch? Because you are, you're all in. I mean, yeah, you've got some investor money, but you've got your own money. You you obviously are vested in this. And when you talk about this, you're not selling me that the global demand is going to grow by 7% because I can't change that. <laughs> you must really believe this has some opportunity. Is it just in these areas or is there something else? Is there something else out there that has you... We can all look at projections and all that. But what has you this excited that you're expanding? Thank you for that. One one of one I'll say is, is what my predictions were, and the other one I'll say is is one of the surprises. And sometimes when you go on an adventure in business, you get both of those. Yeah. What you predict and what you've been surprised with. Sure. What I've been surprised with, and I spoke about it earlier, and and it's the humanization of pets. The the quality of pet specification. The ability to hit high protein levels, highest quality. Some of our customers are asking for identity preserved. They want to know the farm that the very pet food is grown on. And they want to know the entire process of the identity preserved chain. So that's been very surprising. And the growth on that at 11% has been just been phenomenal. So that's that's the surprise. The prediction, these things never come fast enough because we started liking lentils because we could grow them in the drought areas. 
in their drought years, we could grow them with less nitrogen. And when oil and gas was going up and down, nitrogen was going up and down like a yo-yo. And we just didn't want to be as dependent on nitrogen as we were. So we liked them to grow them. And then we suddenly realized that the world liked them maybe to replace the potato, maybe to replace rice, the uh, you know the, the carbohydrates, fantastic. And then suddenly the flexitarian movement came out. The, the vegetarian movement has always been there and that's fabulous. There, That's that niche and that's that's great. But what about the flexitarians? That came out and guys like me, that's carnivores. We started saying, ah, oh, we better not growl and grizzle as much and be, be carnivores seven days a week. We better come in and, 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 and do a better job a better job of taking protein without always having our meat. So I think that's really come to pass in a, in a very significant way. So, and, and ultimately then now we're, we're grinding it into lentil flour. People are making, they're putting lentil, they're building lentil snacks. They're building all things out of, out of lentils and out of peas as well. So it's becoming a mainstay. And finally, um, as you're well aware, uh, uh, the, 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 the great state of Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, this is an extension of our, we call them the prairies, you call them the northern plains. Yeah. Well, it's one It's one big savanna, isn't it? Yeah. And it's all an extension. Of, so they're all absolutely, all the, 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 the protocols of growing, the agronomy, the experience of doing it, it transcends the border. We're doing this within the plains, the great, the great plains yeah. is what we're doing. You know, I've done three speaking engagements in Glasgow, Montana, and every time I go there, I uh, I open my and it's a town of four thousand, by the way. Three times I've been there, paid to travel there, and it ain't easy to get to Glasgow, Montana. And most people don't realize they think of Montana, they think of a picture of Bose, the mountains outside of Bozeman. No, Glasgow looks like whatever you would think of that Saskatchewan or uh, parts of Alberta look like. It's just a big old prairie, and they just grow a whole bunch of crops in there. But every time I go there, I always open my thing with saying. Why the hell did we take this from Canada? And the crowd always laughs. But uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, all joking aside, I love I love going up there, all parts of Montana. So speaking of Montana, I want to hear about the expansion that you're doing. But before I do that, dear listener, uh, it, it's no secret the commodity prices are down. Uh, farm economics are tightening. You need to look at everything you can do to diversify your revenue. What if you could do that through a sustainability program? Maybe you don't farm. But you still have influence on the farm back in Nebraska that you're a part of. You know what? I know that not everybody that listens to this is a farmer, but everybody that listens to this is involved in the business of agriculture. Almost everybody. So sustainability programs are a new revenue source. Diversification of revenue helps you when times are tough. And it's no secret we're going to be there probably for another few years. I've never seen an ag cycle last only one season, okay? <laughs> I've been around this game for a couple of years, so has Mr. Cam Bites. So the point is, sustainability programs through companies like Truterra, they're one of my sponsors. Truterra is focused on supporting you at every stage of the sustainability journey to help you make, plan, and maintain a regenerative management practice, but also to improve, it'll, it'll improve your agronomic your economic and your environmental sustainability program. You can get paid for it. You want to learn more about this, go to TruterraAg.com. Truterra, T-R-U-T-E-R-R-A, part of the Land of Lakes Company. I've been around for a long, long time. Go check it out. Um, you're expanding down into the United States. What did you need it for? Was it just for more market share or did was there some uh, was there some uh, possible synergies? They had genetics, they had processing facilities, they had access to rail. What how did it it's not it, it was probably multiple reasons, but why are you joining? You bought a company, your company's called Above Foods and you bought and looking it up here, you bought the Redwood Group and they are in the pulse business. They are. And yes, yes to all of the above. You're right, Damien. There's many reasons, but the, the principal reasons are they were, they were, in our view, in the Northern Plains, they were the most significant innovators in the pulse business, particularly chickpea and lentil. Great, great experience. They, they've developed relationships with growers and brought growers along to be able to grow chickpeas and grow lentils and supply them. Then they've turned around and they've determined that some of the lentils that are being that the chickpeas, pardon me, that are being grown in Montana are, are not only of the highest quality, in some cases, they're they're more appropriate for certain markets than even the Canadian chickpeas. So they've yeah. carved out great markets. They've got great suppliers to hummus. They're getting paid for extra protein. They do everything well when it comes to pulses, particularly chickpeas and lentils. And for us, what an opportunity to geographically diversify in our lane, exactly in our lane, only in the United States. Sure. Uh, so that's the reason. 
Okay. And so that's an interesting thing that the average person doesn't think about. Just like we might know that, um, you know, number two yellow corn, whatever, or, or these kinds of things, or high oleic soybeans, all pulses are not created equal. There's probably chickpeas that are lower grade and they go to, I don't know, you tell me. And then there's this high, higher protein, higher grade. So there's a grading within these pulses that in that determines where they end up. And so part of your acquisition of the Redwood Group, I'm assuming then helps you find markets for varying degrees or varying production, varying types of production of the of all the stuff you're processing. It does. That's exactly what it does. So our chickpea processing and grower market in Canada, we now have a a, a, a company in the Redwood Group that has more expertise, that does a better job in that particular market and in the largest market, the US market. There's also an opportunity uh, with a good US-based company like, like Redwood to be able to supply the US uh, foreign aid program, as you know, Lentils are, are, I mean, high protein. High protein is what foreign aid should be all about. Yep. And there's a lot of that going in. So we're excited about that. And there's a, as you know, there's a, a very respectfully, there's a demand for, for made in America, grown in America, processed in America products. And this makes it made in America, grown and processed in America. We like that entire, we like the way that feels. And, and we're a U.S. Co- we're a U.S. listed company. We now have a U.S. presence, and the U.S. is where the growth of the market is. You know, we're only 10% of your population up here, as you know. So the 90% is in the United States, and the 10% is in Canada. I think what you just uh, summed up there was, if you can't beat them, buy them. But that's fine, Lionel. We're fine with that. We we appreciate Canadian money coming down here. I mean, even though it's a it's a two it's a two dollars for every one of ours. Hey, no, all joking aside, I love Canadians, and I've got a lot of listeners up in Canada, and I love working in Canada. Um, Crossing the border is always a challenge, but I like working with those people. So here's my question then, uh, my next question for you. When you um, buy this entity, and obviously you expand acres, et cetera, they have processing facilities. Isn't processing, granted, you have to have it, but when you think about products that we eat, we don't eat number two yellow corn, and we really hardly eat soybeans, but most things that we eat have to have refrigeration, shelf life, et cetera. Isn't that one of the benefits of these pulses is they've got tremendous amount of uh, shelf life. I mean, I'm guessing once a lentil comes in, do you even have to dry it down? Do you have to dry it like we dry corn? Very rarely. In most cases, you're bringing it in dry. You're absolutely, and that's it. That's how, that's all you have to do to that product. Clean that product, put it in a bag, clean it, maybe split it, and then put it in a bag. And the shelf life is, as you said, phenomenal shelf life. Like we're it, talking it, a year or plus, more, yeah, right? Yeah, oh, more than that, certainly. Yeah, very good. More very than good shelf life. And then on, on chickpeas, garbanzo beans, they are the most, uh, I'm guessing, least shelf lifey of all of the pulses because they've got to either be canned or processed into something else pretty quickly. Yeah, they've got a little bit of oil in them that makes them a little, a little more susceptible to maybe rancicity. So they can get a little rancid you know, in uh, at, before some of the other pulses will, but they too, as a good dried product, you know, we're not, it's not uncommon for us at our, in our storage, storage silos to have chickpeas that are over one year old and our own storage silos. And in a storage silo, does it look like a grain bin? It is a grain bin. Exactly right. And it just, you, you blow some air on it once in a while? Yeah, once in a while, when you bring it in, you can, you can put a little aeration on it as well. But uh, once it's dry, they, they, they hold and stay very well. And that's the other thing you pointed out, whether it's going for foreign aid or it's going to a developing country. You know, we, you talked about India with its 1.5 million people of potential customers, 1.5 billion, I should say, people, um, potential customers, uh, an ascendant economy, and uh, also about one third of India proclaims to be vegetarian. Seems like the perfect marketplace. But also when you think of India, maybe some unreliable infrastructure, possibly some unreliable electric grid. So... A product like this works a hell of a lot better than American pork or Canadian beef, Albertan beef, because you can put this on a boat and it can take a month to get there and it can be 104 degrees and these pulse crops still fit the bill for that. That's where I would think that this has a real, shall I say, advantage. Significant. David, you've had something that people don't realize. 
the unreliability of electricity. We take we take an electron for granted here. We we get mad when we have a two day brownout once a year. Imagine if you had a, a brownout once a week. You you it changes the way dry shelf dry goods high shelf life goods. Yeah, very significant issue in these emerging and developing countries, and it's becoming somewhat here. You and I had a few deep freezes full of our favorite T-bone steaks in in hurricane country in the United States. Yeah, I don't have to tell you how many times we'd have lost them. Yeah, and and uh, so we're 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 all starting to think that maybe the deep freeze, um, which has become the new pantry in the last thirty years, yeah, twenty years, maybe we're back to the old fashioned pantry where we came from, more of the dry goods pantry. Dry, dry goods, canned goods, et cetera. Well, and, and or a mixture of both. And you talked about, you know, the electricity becoming uh, something we take for granted. Unless you're in California, where, uh, you know, uh, they, they, they uh, California has the same population as Canada, uh, but uh, three times as much crazies, because apparently they, they, they're they telling you you've got to drive an electric car, but they also say you can't run your air conditioning. Uh, sorry, didn't mean to get political. All right, um, <laughs> Lionel Cambites, a couple more things on the way out the door. You talked about supplying customers to uh, in 35 countries. Between Above Foods, your company that you own and uh, or control, and then the company that you're buying in, in uh, the United States, what is the customer base to these countries look like? And we just spoke about India. We talked about some of these. Other, what, what does it look like right now? Are there really 35 country customers? Yeah, there are. But what's happened is particularly with the acquisition of the Montana, our new Montana business, I think we're going to see a, a growth of over 50% of our market in the, of our revenue in the United States. The proliferation of, uh, of uh, we just talked about $100 million of, of, uh, of growth in the pet food business. When I say, well, let's use Mexico and that say, call it the North American market. Yeah. So, we, we, so it'll be over 50% will be in the North American market. Then as you've guessed, as you've guessed, the Indias, of the world, the Colombias of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we do an awful lot through Singapore because Singapore has become that almost an international trading hub. Yeah, so it goes to Singapore day. and then it goes out that, from the, oh, that's the, yeah, that's yeah. the spoken wheel kind of concept. It is all those tiger economies that we would the Malaysia's uh, the uh, the all of those the Thailands they get they get served through Singapore. So at the end of the day, we touch thirty five countries. But I think our growth, we believe our growth is going to be in better for you. In North America and Europe, that's a better for you attitude. Think about that. Better for you, a little better than rice, a little better than a potato. And that's, so, that's it. And, 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 and I'm, I'm going to throw it out there. I like I like Mr. Cambites just fine, but if you're one of my potato clients that's hired me to speak, one of my rice clients, he's saying these things. I am not. I would never. <laughs> no, we we all we all know in agriculture that there are advantages between every commodity and, and we also know that there's disadvantages and so etc now answer me this how vertically integrated does this make you you you're a bit on the production you yourself own a significant amount of farmland saskatchewan but in general you are buying off the free market or are you subcontracting do you need if i want to grow this stuff in kansas montana north dakota south dakota whatever do you pay me do you guarantee me a contract or do I just throw the stuff in the ground and I hope to God that you can I can get rid of it? A little bit of both. We like the we like the contracting model and we'll we'll do a significant amount of our business. We'll be contracting with you. We'll contract with you in different forms of act of God and cooperative contracts that allow us to do that and take it through. And then we can maybe fill the, you know, the last 30, 40% of what we need, we can fill that with, as you would say, the on the market product. So a little bit of both. Contracting works well because we can start growing the products that where we know the end need is. Yeah. The largest pasta manufacturer in North America, out of Eames, Iowa, Barilla, wants a very special Durham Durham wheat grown in North Dakota or Saskatchewan. Then we want to be contracting that because we're going to be sure that there's less glyphosate, that there's it's yeah. it's it's non this, it's got that, and we want to sell it that way to our customer. So. Um... Then processing, and then where where does you where's your last touch? I mean, are you putting stuff in a box? Are you putting it on a rail car? Are you putting it in a bag? Where are how vertically integrated are you? Are you everywhere from the is it from the dirt to my plate or not quite? Uh, it is. Also, uh, it's it, it seed is production. No, we're not. We're not doing seed production. We are, of course, doing some trait work in genetics so our our growers can grow better product, but. 
we certainly go all the way through the value chain and the majority of our business would stop in supplying with you an ingredient, either a whole seed or a split seed, a split pea, uh, a flower. Now, we do have a small part of our business, 8% of our business is, is growing into doing private label. We like private label and CPG. So we have we have a we have a brand Farmer Direct. We have a we have a brand Loma Linda that are brands you can buy our brand in the box as well. But we like we like going to the ingredient and we really like building private label because if I gave showed you the value chain, the supply chain back from Montana, putting it in the ground in Glasgow, yeah. which is a great little town, by the way, you're right back from Glasgow, Montana, and the value chain all the way up to your private label, which you're going to put a private label, you're going to like to see that we control that whole supply chain. Yeah. So what, um, if I'm buying a canister of hummus at Mike Kroger, it, it might be your garbanzo beans, but it's not, you didn't, you didn't make it into hummus. You didn't probably put any of the garbanzo beans into a, into a can. But you took it up to the bulk that came into the facility that did do those things. Is that an accurate assessment? We, we did, yes. We would have taken it up. We would have maybe taken the skin off of that garbanzo bean because we want to be able to sell that to the pet food industry. Perhaps we we have split the garbanzo bean or we've, we've milled it into flour, but we wouldn't be the ones that have put it into that beautiful Sabra uh, uh, hummus, yeah. hummus container. Yeah. And then um, on on the split... Not talking about splitting lentils. I'm talking about the percentage. When we talk about pulses, you gave me chickpeas, you gave me yellow peas, you gave me lentils. I'm not sure if there's any others. Give me a percentage. How much of the consumption is is it one third, one third, one third? I'm guessing yellow peas are probably the lesser amount, and lentils and chickpeas are the bigger amount. But you tell me. Yeah, lentils, of course, would be first, and and uh, and the, I can't give you eight accurate percentages, but. By quite a bit, I would say lentils would be the leader. Secondarily would be yellow pea with the new proliferation of, remember I mentioned yellow pea protein. The Europe loves yellow pea protein. The largest right. yellow pea protein uh, fractionator in the world is Roquette out of France. And and they, they fractionate these yellow peas to make protein for all sorts of products. And last would be the, the garbanzo bean or the chickpea. Okay. So yeah, it's it, it, if I eat a sweet pea, it's it's a, an ingredient more than the the other two. Uh, is that an accurate statement? Yes, it is. Got it. All right. Last question that I didn't ask you. What question did I not ask you that you want me to know about above foods and more importantly, where this whole pulse thing, because you explained a lot about pulses uh, and now I know why you're back on the show. Uh, what, well, what, what thing did we not cover that you think we should cover? Well, a small, a small, a small comment on the quality of infrastructure and agronomy and the approach towards innovation in Montana and the Dakotas. It's special. They want to, they want to be growing new crops, different types of crops. They want to be innovating, and that's what they have to do to survive. So, fantastic. The grower mentality, the grower culture out there is second to none. They're handshake people. They do business in a in a, in a way that is so respectful. So we're really pleased to be in that business culture and, and live up to that. So great growth in the United States. I think that's really where, where we want to be mindful of. The great state of Montana is, is a great place for us to be located now and for us to be operating on. So great, great. Uh, we're very pleased with that. You're going to see us be the suppliers to, to the very largest food companies in the world the greatest companies that build pasta and hummus and bread, they're going to buy direct from us because they're going to want to know the entire supply chain. Yeah. Who dropped the seed in the ground? Did it get dropped in the ground in my farm? And who took it all the way up? And that's the only way, and I see one of your commercials was talking about being involved in regenerative agriculture. That's fantastic. The only way we're going to have that regenerative chain go all the way through is if they can buy from a supply chain like ours. So Above is is a, a great company, and uh, we want everybody who's who's in the business of agriculture to take a look at us and, and keep an eye on us, buy a share or two or three, and 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 help bring on this new revolution of protein. By the way, I appreciate that as a as a closing statement because you did a great job, and you also dropped in the name of my show, the business of agriculture. So you're amazing. Um, you're you're media trained, as we should say. But you know what? You've mentioned it twice, and this is the last point I want to make, and then you can have the very last word on it. But I think we both agree. 
you've mentioned twice about traceability, um, accountability, and really it's source verified. And these are terms that have been tossed around in ag for the last few years. Um, the customer wants to know where their food came from. And now that was a big thing starting a decade or so ago. Most of what I thought was superfluous horse shit. Like I think that the, the person eating their dinner in Toronto, as long as the the chef is somebody they're a fan of and the chef says, oh yes, it's locally raised. They say, oh, see, that's why I love coming here because the chef says it's locally raised. Well, what's local? Yeah, you know, somewhere, somewhere between the Rio Grande and Hudson's Bay. But the thing <laughs> is what you're talking about is where it's really, I think, has some value that that thing of, you want to know where this came from? This was raised in Glasgow, Montana. It was processed at this facility, got put on a train, blah, 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 went to our place, went, got processed here. I I really think, because you've said a couple of times, that there's no question that that's that's real. The buyers of the largest food companies in the world are talking that way. They want that. They, of course, don't want to pay for it the way they should, Damien, but but they are bit by bit, but they want to know. They want to know that that there was no glyphosate sprayed on that, if that's what they're concerned about. They want to know that this was grown on lands that go higher protein. Yeah. They like what they see. They want that. That's going to be part of it. Food, uh, the traceability of food is, is, is certainly very significant. And again, like us 2 billion people in the world who take this for granted, ourselves and the Europeans, yeah. food security, is 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 a is a huge global issue. The counterfeiting of food all over the world yeah. is a very significant issue. And one of my great stories to leave it about counterfeiting was uh, going into a, a a shop in in uh, in China along the side of the road, and I bought six Heineken beer, and I took them back to my hotel room, and my daughter was traveling with me, and we opened, we were having a a, a a glass of beer, and she said, "Dad, this bottle is different." We started looking at it, and that six pack was a counterfeit. Yeah, counter counterfeit beer. So counterfeit food all over the world. Yeah, isn't that interesting? You know, we used, we used to hear that on uh, you know the the nightly news about uh, you know counterfeit Adidas or something. But when you talk about source verified, it's something we can believe more in here than in places of the world where where food is in scarcity than uh, than a, a quality counterfeiting uh, you know a counterfeiting to a pretend quality is an issue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, good story. By the way, I question your taste on the Heineken, but either way, I, I appreciate at least you were drinking. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, and, and by the way, if I if you hire me to come up and speak in Canada, I'm all about drinking a Molson Canadian. All right, his name is Lionel uh, Cam Bites. The company's Above Foods. If you want to learn more about this and keep up with this journey, because the second time he's been on the show, I love his um, I love his. Um, his colorfulness and his ability to explain things and talk about where we are, uh, big picture, and as well as clear down to the field level. If they want to learn more, where do they go? They go to abovefood.com and and watch us on the on the on the uh, on the Nasdaq. We're publicly traded on the Nasdaq. Keep an eye on us. Help us be a great company. And uh, Damien, to you, let's let's catch up in a year or so, and yep. uh, and we'll we'll keep reporting the progress of what's going on. And you are invited to Canada because the two. Magic words, Bolson Canadian. Thank you. <laughs> Happy to do it. All right, he's Lionel Cam Bites. I'm David Mason. Thanks for tuning in. Share this with somebody to listen to it. And remember my good friend over at Trutera, at Redox Grows, and also at Pattern Ag that sponsored and brought this to you. Till next time, I'm David Mason, and this is the Business of Agriculture. Hey, thanks for being here. This episode of the Business of Agriculture was brought to you by Pattern Ag. You've heard me talk about Pattern Ag because I think it's a pretty cool concept. New technology that allows you to predict the problems you're going to have and therefore treat them before those problems cost you money. What kind of problems am I talking about? Pests and disease. Things like cordon root worm, uh, sudden death syndrome, cyst nematode, and a whole bunch of other bad things that happen out there in the field that can cost you money. Guess what? Pattern Ag will let you find out ahead of time if the disease or the pest pressure is there and therefore you're treating it before it costs you any money. What a great concept. Go to pattern.ag, that's www.pattern.ag to learn more about their product, their technology, how it can make you money, save you yield, and all also, where you can find a rep that can come out there and do the work for you. Pattern.ag.